But uh, thanks for coming on, James. It's been uh, it's been a wee while since since I've seen you. Yeah, same. Um, well, yeah, it has been a long time. There's a lot happened too, hasn't there? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, thanks for coming on, though. It's uh, it's good to, to finally speak to you. We finally got a date and a time arranged. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about all things music um, for yourself. And um, I think you're the, the only guest that's been on that the, I think the first time we ever met was Christmas Day. <laughs> I think that was. Yeah, no, I've got very famous photos of you and I wearing the matching shirts. Yeah, and I think the second time we met was also Christmas Day. <laughs> I think the, so, yes, of course, because I came I came to one of your Christmas family Christmases that your mum held at her workplace, like a long, long yes, time ago. What, and I had my kids with me at that time. I I think that was about 10 years ago. Yeah, and your daughter was... Very young, same age yeah, as my daughter. Because I, I can't remember. We always had family Christmas at the house. Yeah. I think we had it at my mum's work because there was that many people coming along. There wasn't yeah. enough space in the house. I think my dad was possibly, I think that was maybe the year he took a heart attack because he was unfortunately in hospital that year. And we had to go and take food to him in the hospital. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, and yeah. your friend had flew over with yep. your kids who were really young at the time. Yep. And that ver that very same friend has just recently spent almost two weeks with me here and has just right. gone back home. Yeah, so another and, and, opportunity to catch up with yeah, him. Yeah, I think that was maybe, maybe, it might have been over 10 years ago and then the second time you came for Christmas... Would it, was that before COVID? Must have been. I was on tour with Real Rocky and we were in Glasgow. Right. And I think, um, so obviously Jane and Alex were up there. I, I've got a memory of either being picked up or catching a train. It was maybe five years ago, something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's the one where you, me, your dad and Alex are wearing the matching T-shirts. <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> yeah, 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 but... Uh, there you go. There's no, there's no other guests that have been on that I've only I've ever met twice on Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. But uh, thanks for coming on. But James, what I like to do is I go back to the very beginning for everybody. So where were you originally brought up? All right. So I'm born and raised in Australia. Um, my father was a Welshman who emigrated when he was in his very early twenties and married an Aussie woman. And then yep. along came three kids. So we were born, all born down under. Um, my father joined the Royal Australian Navy. So I was born in Victoria, the state of Victoria. But my right. two sisters were born in the state of New South Wales. So my father was posted quite a bit. Um, but as a result of that, my first sort of 10 or 14 years on the planet was moving quite a bit. Um, People who are from armed forces backgrounds will understand that you get posted in a big country like Australia. You can, you literally can move a thousand or two thousand kilometres at a time. Um, um, so yeah, I, I was born and raised in Australia. Um, I would currently call Queensland home now, which is right. quite a bit further north than than Victoria. So as an adult, I moved to Queensland and settled there. Yeah. See when, see when you were were young. Were you exposed to music from a young age? Absolutely. So my mum was a keyboard player. She actually used to play the, uh, you know, the old-fashioned two hands on the organ with the foot pedals. Yeah. She did all that at the local church. So she's quite a skilled keyboard player with my mum. Um, right. And I got a love of music through both my parents. So my, my father was much more into classical music, orchestral music. He was a massive fan of things like Gilbert and Sullivan, that sort of thing. Um, he did like some pop music, so his love of pop sort of went as far as perhaps the Beatles or whatever. My mum was the rock and roll girl. So my mum was the one buying all the original Queen singles coming out in the 70s. And mm -hmm. it's, I, I think it was through mum that I got my love of rock and pop. Yeah. Um, plus she was a hands-on instrumental player as well. So there was always a piano when I was growing up. It was only an upright, it wasn't anything flash. Mm -hmm. But there was always a piano in the house. Um so my earliest memories is I used to sit at that piano without any lessons and just play little tunes by ear. I could just figure, I'd make things up. I'd, I'd just make out chords and 
mm-hmm. things. And, and I think it was at that point my mum went, oh, this kid needs some lessons, you know. Like, yeah. But, yeah, so my parents were always listening to music. It was There was never no music, yeah. What what age were you then when you discovered your own musical taste? So, so what and what type of bands would you have been discovering for yourself? Um, I, I remember having, and I guess it might have been through my parents initially, but I had a massive love, and I still do for the Beatles. So my 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 mum and dad between them had like original albums that came out in the sixties yeah. when they were pressed when they were teenagers, and they bought them, and I used to. I used to, I have got a memory of being like quite young, about 10 or 11 and coming home from school. So that would have been probably like the last years of, in Australia would have been the last years of primary school Yeah, yeah. before you go to high school. And um, I used to come home from school and grab the white album out and put on um, happiness as a warm gun. And only because like lyrically it made no sense to me. And I guess it still doesn't make much sense, but I love the sound of the song. I love the chords. I love the melody, and and it was catchy lyrically. Even if, as a ten or twelve year old, I didn't really know what it meant. But I do remember my mum thinking or saying, I think she said it to my father. It's quite concerning that James comes home from school every day and whacks that one particular song on about a happiness is a warm gun. And I think they had to hide the White Album from me for a while, so I wasn't. Yeah. But I remember my love of that was I was just I was listening to the chords and the rhythms, and I wasn't. You know, the the fact that I was singing about a warm gun meant nothing to me. But I do have that memory of mum going, oh, that's a bit of a worry, you know. <laughs> but, um, so I, I guess the Beatles was my first deep love as a, like a very young adult. I just have devoured everything I could of the Beatles. Yep. Yeah. Even you were saying your, your parents were buying these these albums, like the originals when they were yeah. first. Now, obviously, you... you you, you you knew my mum and dad, so my dad, especially being the, the big music um, fan, he obviously had a bo- boxes of LPs up in the loft, and, and he had them for years after the record player had broken, and you know they didn't even have a record player, but they still had boxes of LPs, and uh, he was a big Doors uh, fan, yeah, and I always remember because because. Records are back in fashion now with yeah. the music shop, but it's just LPs everywhere. And uh, he had the Early Woman, the last album by The Doors. I don't know if you've seen it, but he had the original one where it was, the, the, the album cover was red, but the, the sleeve bit of it was, I think, um, white. And what happened was when you, when you slid it together, it was made up as if it was like a, an old envelope. So yeah. the top right-hand corner was, was like, it was yellow. And when you slid it in, the picture of the group was sat behind it, almost like yeah. it was. And when you go to buy that in the shops nowadays, it, it's just printed all on the one cover. It, so it's yeah. not, you can tell it was an original compared to what you would buy now in the shops. Obviously everything else looks pretty much the same, but there's just those wee things that are probably missing that had you not bought it back in the olden days, you, you know. Well, you- I, I love the white album because what, it was a double album, so it opened out, but it was completely white. But it, um, the, the copy that my parents had had all the original inserts, so it had the four original black and white prints of the Beatles. And, and I, I used to, I, I don't know, there's something almost like, religious about I used to look at those prints and just think who are these mystical gods <laughs> it really had a massive impact on me the White Album in particular but the Beatles more generally mm-hmm. until I became a dirty teenager in high school and then I was a teenager during the 80s so suddenly 80s pop just on the airwaves on the MTV was a proper when it started MTV it was an actual proper music yeah that played clips. We In Australia, we had lots of good music shows that played all the clips. So then I just started to get inundated with all those classic pop and rock songs from like 82 right through to 88. So I am unashamedly a child of like 80s Madonna and 80s Prince and 80s Culture Club and, oh, God, you know. But the other, the other thing you've got, so someone I had on previously had said this, that they were a massive pop fan but they said they're, they're a pop fan of 
pop music from the 70s and 80s and, he, and said what you've got to understand is pop music then is very different to what pop music is nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And especially back then, a lot, a lot of pop music was still bands writing popular music. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, five songwriters sat around the table writing a song for someone who it's questionable whether they've actually got any talent or not, but, yeah. but they're very successful. Um, so pop music back then was very different to pop music nowadays. Yep. Yep, I agree. It was still more band orientated. It was still more about um, singer songwriters with bands like George. Mar- George Michael's yeah. a great example in Wham, yeah. writing those phenomenal pop. I would call them pop songs, but yeah. with a full band backing with horns and a live drummer and a live bass player. Yeah, and, and there's there's no denying that a good song is a good song, yeah. regardless of who who's who's done it, where it's came from, but. Obviously, you're saying that you were tinkering away on the your mum's piano or that, but you know I know that you play the guitar. Was the guitar the sort of the proper first instrument that that you picked up, or or was it the the piano? No, I'd say it was the piano. So um, I initially was getting lessons just from a lovely older lady that lived in our town that took like a token payment yeah. just to be able to pass on some skills to me. I learned a lot from her. But then as I showed more promise, it was time for me to actually do the proper graded piano training that you'll do something similar here, but there's like eight grades in Australia, A, M, E, B. And and if you get to, if you get to finally to grade eight and pass eight, you're a pretty good piano player. I never got that far. I think I got about to grade four and then life happens. I was in my teens. My mum and dad split up. There wasn't the sort of money available for that sort of thing. But so my first proper instrument was piano. To a reasonable level where I had to play for gradings at the end of each year to be able to pass to the next year. Yep. And um, my first and most important exposure to, to music theory, all the things that still stay with me today, even though I'm no, I no longer remain a good reader, but I still can look at a piece of music and understand its time signature and its key and I can understand the length of the notes. So I might not be able to like read it like a fluent English reader can read a page. I might still need to get my pencil out and stuff. <laughs> but those things have never really left me, thankfully. I've still got that basic understanding of some sort of music theory just from those years of being able to play the piano. But that sort of stopped in my mid-teens because of, like I said, um, unfortunately my parents' marriage I think it played a major part there. My mum and dad split up and yep. we moved away and there wasn't sort of disposable income to do that sort of thing. So um, I, I had a little incremental step to guitar. Do you want to hear it? Basically, yeah. I was yeah. in high school and our high school had a pretty good drama slash music program and every year they put on a play, a, a musical, and uh, it would be – the band would always be led by, say, the music teacher and all the gun students that could play. And I was a keyboard player, even then. So it would it would be like the music teacher would be the MD on keys one, and I'd play keys two. And I got to about grade 10, which is about 15 or 16, 15 in Australia, and um, I got told, well, sorry, James, this year you won't be playing piano. This new young girl who started in grade seven is like a whiz, like a prodigy, and she'll be playing the piano. So you're out. And I went, what do you mean I'm out? I've done it for four years. You know, like, no, she she has to have the gig. And I went, huh. And the gentleman that used to play bass had graduated. Year 12 is the last year. He'd finished. So I said, so are there any openings? And she said, well, Doug, who used to play bass, has left. So... You could always play bass. And I said, well, I'll do you a deal. If the school buys a bass guitar, I'll learn how to play it. And I will be the bassist at the, in the end of year school musical. And they said, deal. So the school bought like a Fender copy, cheap black bass guitar. And I spent every lunch hour and I'd even get special permission to take it home on weekends or what have you to just learn this thing that I'd never played before. However, I had all that theory of music from learning the piano. So it was really just learning mechanically how to trans- transpose that over to a different instrument, but the concepts behind the notes were all the same, right? So yep. for me, it was just about I've got to just step through 
a different way of playing. And I, in the course of a year, I just learned basically, I'd never professed to be a good bass player, but I learned enough to be able to play bass in the school band for that one year. And then something quite similar again is <laughs> in my naivety, and please, if there's any bass players watching, please don't shoot me. But as a young kid, I was thinking, well, I've done the four string thing. So the next logical obvious step is the six string thing, right? right. So I, I looked at it as like a progression. I would never, never ever look at that. Now, I probably would have been quite happy to stay on bass. And yeah. if, if my life had been different, I could have been a bass player. I still love bass players. I still seek out bass playing videos on YouTube yeah. or drumming videos on YouTube. Right? I'm not just a music I just don't just love guitar playing, but yeah. but yeah, I did. I got my very first guitar at about sixteen, so I came to guitar quite late, mm -hmm. and I had quite a lot of piano playing before that, and this little experimental moment on bass for a year. And the other thing I did too was I also took rudimentary drum lessons from a drum teacher. Yeah. So I remember I also had like a practice pad, and I was just learning rudiments mm -hmm. and stuff. So I'm um, I'm one of those guys who can just sit at the kit and also bash out a reasonable. Yeah. Again, nothing, nothing too fancy or anything. But I got, uh, can at least do that. And um, yeah, sixteen was when I got my first ever guitar. I remember it clearly. Um, I was so naive with the guitar, though. I didn't even know you could buy independent individual strings for it. So my uncle could play a bit of guitar, and he played my guitar one day and accidentally broke the thinnest E string on it. Yeah. And he went, "Oh, sorry about that, James. Here's some money going." buy another string and I didn't know you could just buy single <laughs> strings. So for like the next six yep. months, I just played it with five strings. So uh, how, <laughs> how did you learn guitar then? Because similar to myself, growing up, there was no internet, there was no YouTube. No. To, and I don't know what it was like for yourself. It was, it was hard where I was to find sheet music and all, and because I, I don't know how to read sheet music. You had to rely, hope that there was tablature down the bottom yeah. to tell you. So were you kind of similar as, and, and also you, you do learn from other people. They show you bits and pieces and you then figure it out eventually by year. Well, I've been blessed my entire life with having a phenomenal ear. So much so that I remember when I used to learn piano, Mm -hmm. So I'd finish the previous year and I'd then be like into grade three. And, she, and my teacher would go, here are the pieces for grade three. And I'd say, oh, could you play them through once for me so I can hear how they go? And she'd go, yeah, sure. And she'd play them once. And my brain would just be going, 80% of it would just be sinking in. She cottoned on to that after a while. She said, I'm not playing you any of these pieces anymore. You just learn them by ear, don't you? You need to be reading them, not, not listening to me and parroting them back. So I've had this ability my whole life which has come in handy so many times as a covers guitarist in covers or tribute shows i can basically listen to a standard pop or rock song and play 95 percent of that back to you you know pretty much straight away so as a kid growing up how i learned to play the guitar was i simply sought out the records i wanted to so i went through this once i once i decided i want to be a guitar player I still loved all my 80s pop, don't get me wrong. I was still listening to um, <laughs> I was still listening to things like Howard Jones and Nick Kershaw and all of that stuff, you know. But I started to get right into pretty classically loved guitar players. So my first real big love, I guess, was Pete Townsend. Right, okay. So I sort of I sort of got I went, wow, the who? Holy crap, you know? Mm -hmm. The power of just one big fat chord and the attitude yeah. that came with that. And then, then I went through my, um, my my Jimmy Page bit, you know, where I went, oh my god, okay, Zeppelin, that's serious stuff. But um, and and of course, I always loved the Beatles, so I was like rediscovering them, but as a guitarist rather than just as a music lover. Um, and what I would do is I'd quite literally just drop the needle into the groove and just listen and play that back. That's how I taught myself how to play. Yeah. Um, when I finally, so my mum always, my mum had all these Queen records, but it. There's a period in my life when I was just a kid listening to them and loving them as songs, and then there's a yeah. period in my life where I became like a very young adult and went, oh, they're all quite in serious instrumentalists in their own right. And then when I, I was about 16, I got my first guitar, and I went through that period of like trying out different bands and falling in love with them, but it was when I really listened to Queen songs, I went, oh, okay, 
So over and above any other guitarist on the planet, Brian just spoke to me like no other person. So the yeah. first serious riff I ever learned in my life was um, Now I'm Here by Brian, by Queen, which is right. a song off their third album. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the very first serious the song I ever learned on the, on the guitar. I really wanted to learn that. Yeah. And so, yeah, just blessed with a good ear. So you're obviously get, get into to the guitar when you're sort of mid-teens of that. Do you remember what, what was the first concert you ever attended? Yeah, I, I remember. Um, so when I was um, mid-teens, there was an Australian outdoor festival, you know, kind of like Glastonbury, but like one-tenth of the size. Yeah. <laughs> and it was outside Melbourne, not far from Melbourne. And I saw in the mid '80s a lineup of bands that culminated with a big Aussie rock band at the time called Noiseworks. Right. And Noiseworks headlined that thing, and I was about 15. And Noiseworks were a pretty standard kind of Aussie rock band for its time, a bit like In Excess, keyboard players and rock guitar players, but all in the one lineup doing pop slash rock songs. But in Noiseworks, they have a phenomenal guitarist. Mm -hmm. And that, and I saw them live and I just went, oh, wow, like he was prevalent in the mix and it sounded amazing. So that was the first local band. And then the first international act I ever saw was at the Melbourne Entertainment Centre in 1986. I saw Simple Minds. Right. That was like, so that was at the height of their stadium powers. I think um, Once Upon a Time, the album had just come out with Alive and Kicking on it and stuff like that. And... Um, I went to that, and that was the first international act I ever saw. Again, a bit of a throwback to, like, my love of all things 80s. So, like, Simple Minds was a pretty quintessential yeah. 80s band at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they were the first two major gigs I ever saw. Yeah. What about, um, did you start wanting to start your own band or join a band? So, luckily in high school, the the whole focus on like the end of year school musical was enough for me. Um, I was just learning those songs. We'd have like weekends together. We even have like I remember that they would have this thing called like school music camp where yeah. we might go for five days and they'd be learning their lines and stuff. But the band would go off and just play the songs. That kind of must have fulfilled quite a lot of of that in me because I didn't really seek to join or be part of any kind of band type uh, arrangement until high school had finished for me. Yeah. So, so yeah, I came to the guitar late compared to a lot of other guitarists and I sort of joined bands late ish too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the bands that you were joining, was that just a bit of fun really playing cover songs? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting. So the first few bands I joined, so um, when I finished high school, my mum made the decision that she wanted to move from Victoria to Queensland. Now, that's if anyone knows the size of Australia, that's that's London to Edinburgh times two. You know, it's a long, right. long way away, right? So we moved to this completely new town in a completely different part of Australia, just outside Brisbane. I'm a young adult. Um, I'm actually unemployed because I just moved there, so I'm in the process of looking for a job. And nearby was a pub, and they had this thing called the Local Musicians Club that met every Friday and Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And you paid, like, a couple of dollars at the door and just went in, and they had, like, a stage and a PA set up, and people could just jump up. Yeah. And um, a lot of bands formed from that arrangement, and I was new to town, and I just started going to this thing. And I started meeting people around my age or – you know, who were also sort of in the same boat, looking to want to play with people. So you'd, you'd get up in these awkward moments and try to play some pretty classic cover tune together at that yep. point. But one of my first serious bands that formed out of that was, um, it was essentially a covers band, but we were determined to write our own songs. So we recorded our own demos. Mm -hmm. We burnt our own CD at the time. Yeah. And we tried to flog them off at concerts and, or at, at local shows, but we would essentially be booked as a covers band, but try to slot every third or fourth song would be an original tune in. Mm -hmm. we, we had this, <laughs> we had this, and it was quite a hard rock band too. Like, it wasn't pop. Right. It, was, um, it was a twin guitar lineup, a five piece band, and my co guitarist was a, a massive metalhead. 
Pantera, Dimebag, Daryl, yes. Se- Sepultura, Metallica, all the way. And, and all that was quite new to me because I'd come from this stupid poppy, I love everything Beatles and 80s yep. pop. <laughs> um, but the guitar is such a versatile instrument. You can be a pop art- artist on it or a hard rock, heavy metal artist on it. Mm-hmm. It lends itself to all sorts. So, yeah, my first ever band was like, started off as a covers band, but very quickly we really wanted to write songs. So we wrote our own songs. We, we got to, re- we entered competitions. We actually came first or second in one of them and it got us like 10 hours recording time. And we used that to cut, like we did it basically live, but we recorded like five of our best originals onto that. And yep. we just funded our ourselves really basic artwork. I think the other guitarists actually created it. Mm-hmm. And we just got these CDs and we tried to, sell them or whatever we could with them yeah it's that funny was, to see that that's initially what i had what i did yeah it's what you're talking about there it's actually started happening again uh, through in sterling there was a, there was a person that i had on this will be season this will be um an episode in season two so the first episode of season two it was a person called barry honeyman yeah uh, barry Started. Um, it's called Central Scotland Song Club, and it's it's almost identical identical to what you've just said. And you go along. There's, there's certain pubs where it's set up every every week. You can go along, and there's, they've already got a PA system. They've already got a guitar. So it, it's even if you want to go along and you've maybe never played in front of people before, it gives you a wee opportunity to get up and. You can either play a cover song, you can play your own original song. Yep. You know, there's there's two or three people have uh, started doing that, and it's it's been picking up over the last sort of year uh, across central Scotland. You're getting a lot of people, and there's a lot of people meeting other musicians as a result. The only thing you don't seem to get in Scotland is, and I've heard this because I've, I've spoke with quite a few bands, strangely from, enough from Australia, from Melbourne area, and there all there seems to be like competitions and that. That's not the, there's never any competitions in Scotland, but there is the opportunity to go along and you know try out playing in front of people or try yeah. your own songs and stuff. So it sounds kind of similar that way. We were super lucky to have it in in our local town. That's for sure. And it was it was popular and a great resource. And I, and I fell in and out of a couple of different bands from that arrangement. Yeah. So yeah. for anybody that's watching, obviously. I, I know you for with regard to you playing later on. You, you, you're a, a musician within the theatre world. But how did that come about? What age were you, first of all? And then how did it actually, how did you manage to get your foot in the door with, so, with that? So, you have, so bearing in mind that I'm a guitarist and a Queen fan, a massive Queen fan, and I've got a good ear, right? Yeah. So I spent the first few years of learning how to play listening to Queen Records. Mm. And like you remember how you said it's before the internet, right? Yeah. It's before the internet. So I did there were some Queen albums I didn't even know existed. And then it it'd be a matter of you've read it you've read it in some magazine and you go, What? There's an album between that one and that one that I didn't even know. And then you'd go down to the record store guy and he'd get out his massive old manual and he'd go Oh yeah, there, there's a, there it is. I can order that. It'll be here in two weeks. I'll be like, ah. you know, like it was like Christmas. It's like a new release. It might have been released twenty years ago, but it's like this is new. Yeah. So I got my hands on every and any Queen recording I could, along with other artists, but Queen in particular, and just devoured. Um, trying to play, isn't that this isn't going to sound right? I never wanted to ape his style. I never wanted to be Brian May, but the way he played spoke to me as a guitarist. So the way he played, his sound and the way he phrases things was like, oh, for me, this is the pinnacle. Like, I I just taught myself how to play by listening to how he did things. That's important to know because, so for, for all the way through my 20s, I just played in covers bands, covers slash originals bands, if you like. Um, but as I got older, the originals thing even fell by the wayside. So as I got older, I got married had children, was trying to hold down a permanent job in the public service, and music just became about that massive outlet on the weekend with my three other mates. Yeah. Where we had a covers band. We played in and around Brisbane and sometimes further afield than that. We played every Friday and Saturday night. So that was the thing we looked forward to. We, it was this massive sense of camaraderie. We'd come together. 
Um, the whole thing about trying to write our own songs and push that had almost fallen by the wayside a bit. It was more about can we at least just still be playing somewhere. So we just play in these huge clubs and pubs in Brisbane. As long as people are having fun, so are we. Um, and then I, I didn't make this transition until my 30s. I was 32 when I first got to play any theatre show, which was We Will Rock You. Mm-hmm. But how that came about was um, I'd heard on the grapevine, thankfully by now the internet is a thing, and I've heard on a grapevine that We Will Rock You and it's running in London. It had been running for six or nine months. And the very next production of it, so it's going to be only the second production of it anywhere in the world, and the very first international one was going to open in Melbourne. Right. And that Brian and Roger were going to fly out and they were going to oversee auditions and rehearsals and, and what have you, right? And I just thought, wow, you know, wouldn't that be amazing? But they were going to Melbourne. I lived in Brisbane. Like I said, that's... London to Edinburgh times two away. It's a long way away. Yeah. Uh, I, I myself was going through a marriage breakup at that time too. I had other priorities and I just thought, I didn't even know how you can make that step from part-time musician to, you know, like I held down a normal day job and just played on the weekends. That's what I yeah. did. And, um, but to cut a very, very, very long story short, some friends of mine got a CD together of some songs that I'd played at a Queen fan club convention. So Australia used to have this one once a year Queen fan club convention. And once I put my hand up and said, I'll throw a band together and we'll play deep album cuts for the fans. And somebody recorded that. And so we had a recording of that. And these friends of mine flew to Melbourne and found out the hotel that Queen's manager was staying at and left a CD for him with my work business card in it. And then the next day I get this phone call and it's from Jim Beach, Queen's manager, and I'm at work, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't know my mates had done this. And he goes, hi, it's, you know, Jim Beach. Um, I, I thought it was one of my friends kidding because I actually said, oh, yeah, right, nice one, Brett, well done. <laughs> Very funny. He goes, no, 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 this is Jim Beach. And then I realised, oh, yeah, it sounds like an Englishman and he sounds very serious, you know. <laughs> He said, look, I've, I've got up this morning, gone down to reception. There's a blank envelope in it. Is a blank CD with the, your business card in it. Can you tell me what that's about? And I didn't know. So oh, I just, have I you just not told you? No. All right. No, they were waiting to fly back to tell me this. Um, I, my, I just very, very quickly put two and two together and went, Jim, what I think's happened is friends of mine have gone down to Melbourne for this, there was a big press conference. Yeah, yeah. And um, and uh, they really think that I should have an opportunity to audition for the upcoming band, and I think they've just left you something to listen. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. And he went, okay, that's all I need to know. And he just hung up. And I went, oh, <laughs> wow. Okay. And about half an hour later, the phone rings again. Hey, James, it's Jim Beach again. This time his tone is a bit different. He's friendly. And I went, oh, Jim, yeah, how, how can I help you? And he goes, well, the boys and I have had a listen to it, and um, we'd actually like you to come down for the audition. And I, in my naivety, I just went, who, who are the boys? And he went, Brian and Roger from Queen. <laughs> we've, played your, we've played your CD, and, and they want you to come down for an audition. And I went, what? So in the space of half an hour of my life, yeah. what, I've got two friends to thank for, going, for, for doing that on my behalf. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's how I jagged an audition. So then I had to fly from Brisbane to Melbourne and they did two full days of band auditions. And on my day, they had enough personnel to do two completely different band lineups, if you like. So they had like two drummers, four keyboard or six keyboard players. They had four Just guitarists, best. two bassists. See, when you're saying that they're obviously looking for a guitarist, at that moment in time, though, are they st- still looking for a drummer or a bass player? Like, if they, uh, so, so there's not a set band yet. It's just they're trying to find the right person for each role. So, in, in a traditional theatre show, um, particularly in the UK, the fixer will fix a band in conjunction with like the musical director or supervisor, and mm-hmm. and definitely down under, the musical director would be appointed, and they would go. Yeah, I want Ian on guitar. I've worked with Ian before. He's the right kind of guitarist for this gig, you know. I want James on guitar too. He's, you know, 
it would be play it would be all put together sort of in house right the whole catch 22 thing is you, like once you're in that system you're on people's minds but how do you even get into that so i just didn't know you know mm-hmm. what brian and roger wanted to do completely differently was they they said we don't want your standard theatre band put together. We don't want to appoint one person to have them appoint all of their theatre mates. So we want this to have a rock and roll edge. And if that means drawing on people from outside of theatre right. and incorporating that into the theatre world, that's what we're going to do. So we're going to audition everybody. So what was very unheard of was they actually even auditioned the MDs. So they made the MDs go through an audition process. Yes. Once they'd selected an MD, they then... They then selected the, the members that they wanted to work with the MD. Mm-hmm. So very, very unusual and worked in my favour. Otherwise, there's no way I would ever got to look in. So um, at the time, I was working for Queensland Rail, which is a state-owned railway company in Queensland. So I was a public servant. I had to take time off work to fly down, and I had to go through this audition process that Brian and Roger were at. And um, it, it was the most unreal two hours of my life, like shaking like a leaf, just over overawed by the whole thing. So see, so when you go down, when you go down and you show up, what is the process? So do they say to you, right, James, we're going to, we want, do you need to show up? Do you know what songs you're going to be playing? Yeah. So what Jim, so when Jim said, we'd be delighted to have you come down for an audition. And I said, yeah, I'll make that happen. And he said, right. So, he said, at the same reception desk that your friends left the CD, I'm now going to leave you a package. And in that package, you're going to have the sheet music to two songs from the London version of the show and a copy of the cast recording with the same thing. But what we want, these are the two songs they told me in, beforehand, um, and we want you to learn all the guitar parts associated with those songs, both rhythm and lead. And, um, and the two songs happen to be One Vision and Who Wants to Live Forever. So, like, one rocky number, one touching ballad. Yeah. So I knew that in advance. So I – but I didn't know that the versions from the London show would be, like, theatrised versions of the – so I just learnt the songs off the albums. Mm -hmm. Then I fly down the night before, the day before, so the afternoon before, and I go to that hotel and I grab that stuff, and then I put the CD on and go, shit, they're not the same, you know? Yeah. They're not the same. They cut. They've cut bars here, or they've rearranged it this way to make it fit a theatre um, pro the format, you know. And I and I so I sat up to like midnight or one a.m. that m- morning, just relearning it, you know. Um, yeah, and then then there was a whole day of auditions on Monday, which I was part of, and then another whole day on Tuesday. And as I said, they had. Uh, it was going to be two guitarists in the lineup, so they had at least four guitarists there, and they were chopping and changing people. They were like, they they actually said, right, you're like in band B, you can sit out for the first two minutes. We're sending band A, and they went through their two songs. And when I say we're inside one of South Melbourne's biggest recording studios, where lots of Aussie acts have recorded like in excess and what have you, so again, so they just hired out one of the big live rooms, and they were sitting on the control panel side with the glass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we we're just in the live room. And they'd set, they'd already had, you know, amps and drum kit and that set up. You just have to take your own instrument. And um, that was the that was the vibe. So you, you sat out in the green room waiting your turn and then they go, right, hey, you can go in now. And I mean, that that moment of my life would be another interview because that what, what I went through and how, how it happened is a story that, you know, I guess one day I should write it down because <laughs> it's worth reading. <laughs> But to cut a very long story short, I did a pretty good job. And the pre- reason why I did a pretty good job is I know their stuff. Like yeah. I played sympathetically like a fan would. I, I wasn't coming from it as a – there were hardened, seasoned theatre professionals in there who just didn't have the right feel. In fact, one guy brought his like semi-acoustic Gibson 335, you know, that you'd play jazz gigs on. And he's trying to play One Vision on that, you know. And I just thought you don't, you don't even get the brief, you know. Yeah. Well, but, but um, I do remember right at the very end, Jim Beach came up to me and introduced himself to me. And I said to him, I said, oh, Jim, I have to really thank you. I said, because you could have just thrown that CD in the bin, you know, but you, you actually put it on and listened to it and now I'm here. And um, he went, actually, we just want to, we have to thank you because 
you know, we, we're blessed that you, we've been able to find you. Um, and then the executive producer came up to me and introduced herself to me. Mm-hmm. And she said, James, you've done really, really well in there today. Uh, any chance you could, like, send me a bio? I said, i got nothing to send you. She said, just send me anything. And I said, it's going to be a page long, and half of it will be my photo. And she said, that's fine. And honestly, I just basically I sent out played in covers bands, you know, like I had no, I'd done nothing of that nature of that, that kind of standing before. Mm-hmm. And they, they said to me, right, so as you know, there's another whole day worth of auditions tomorrow. And then we're going to take probably between four and six weeks to make a decision. And then if you, if you, you know, you'll find out. So that was Monday. On Friday, I got mm-hmm. a phone call offering me the position. So only four days had passed. And um, what a feeling that must have been. Well, I was at work, right? I was at work, 10.30 in the morning, working in a railway depot. So as working class as you could get. The radio station's on. It had just played. And this is no shit. You can't, like I said, you can't write this. It had just played, We Will Rock You, We Are the Champions, back to back, right? Yep. And they said, that was Queen with We Will Rock You, We Are the Champions. Phone rings, picks it up. It's the associate producer of the production company. It just said, hi, I'm so-and-so following up from your audition Monday. Um, we'd like to offer you the, the, rock, the position of guitar one in the upcoming We Will Rock You tour of Australia. And I went, I just told I wouldn't find out for four to six weeks. And he said, oh, no, at Brian was adamant we had to secure your services. <laughs> and I went, okay. I said, who else? And I said, oh, no, four or six weeks for everybody else. We don't know, but we had to get you. And I, I went, wow, okay. Brilliant. See having, see, having never done that before, did you have anything like imposter syndrome or that, like, you massively. Were, so didn't deserve to be here because massively. maybe everybody else is a, is a professional, if you know what I mean? They were. They were all professional. They were either unknown to me, but uh, they were theatre, seasoned theatre professionals who do all the big theatre shows. Or they had, they were crossing over from the rock world. So, there's an Australian artist called Vanessa Amorossi. You may or may not be familiar with her. She's a female solo artist, kind of like a hard rock chick with a strong, soulful, kind of like a Jessie J. Right, kind okay. Of that vibe. Her touring guitarist slash MD was there at the audition. Mm-hmm. And I knew that he, that was, you know. And they were all sh- – there's another guy called James Rain. He was, he's another solo artist, but he was also in um, – yeah, you know, the Australian Crawl, another big Australian band. Anyway, so there are all these musicians are going, oh, Frank, well, it's good to see you. What are you? I'm on, I'm on, the, I'm on the current tour with so-and-so. Oh, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, I'm touring with so-and-so. Yeah, right. And it was all that, right? Yeah. Except me. And then, like, they'd get around to me and, and they go, oh, who are you? I'm James. Oh, what are you doing? Oh, I work for Queensland Rail. And that was this, like, kind of, oh, brush him. He, he's, what, yeah. what is he even doing here, right? But this um, this guy that did work for Vanessa Amorossi, he actually was a really good ally because he just looked at me and he said, he said, oh, bugger those guys. He said, we all put our pants on the same way in the morning. Hi, I'm so-and-so and shook my hand. And so so that was lovely. But, yes, I, I just sat there going, what am I doing here? Yeah. However, I must have been the only guy that played it the way Brian wanted to hear it. Yeah. You know, and I think that's what they were looking for. They wanted to get these outside sort of so, structures in place. See, with obviously getting that phone call, how long was it before, like, I, I don't know how it works, so how long was it from getting that phone call to when, do you have to go for rehearsals before, obviously, the show then begins? Yeah. So how long is rehearsals? I, I think I got that phone call in about March, and then the show opened in August, and rehearsals were in July. So... So does the band just meet up in like a rehearsal room? And yeah, just, so what, just what happened was because um, it, it was a massive big deal. It, it had like backing from the Victorian government. It had like um, we had a huge profile because it was going to be Brian and Roger down under overseas. And ben Elton, of course, was there as well. Um, it, had, it had this huge hype about it. And so the cast come together about, well, I guess it was about six weeks before opening to start learning stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, now, what was unheard of is like the band would normally only get about two days, but in our case, we got two weeks. We got right. two weeks. 
It's unheard of. Like the MD, a very skilled Australian musical director who'd done a lot. He's done a lot of stuff. He, he's older than me and said that Queen was a, a in in the seventies. Queen was one of his favourite bands, but he's much more classically trained keyboard player and has done things like Les Mis and Cats and all that sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But but the right sort of guy to be in charge of all of this. Yeah. And um, he he said to me. Soak this up because if you ever get to do this again, it'll never be like this. You'll never have the luxury of getting paid for two weeks to come in, learn a couple of songs, share a few anecdotes, go for a coffee. They were, so it was being overseen by a British guy who was called the musical supervisor. His job was to make sure that all the shows had the same vibe and feel and all played within the same parameters. So he's like the musical director's boss. There's one musical supervisor and you might have 15 productions around the world and they all sort of, he'll come and visit them. And he'll go, well, I like what you're doing there, but we, let's not, let's move that this way a bit so it fits in with the other shows. You know, like, just keeps yeah. a lid on it. But he, he had such a – he deliberately went down the road of half of this band have never done theatre before. So we're not going to overawe them. We're not going to throw at them the sort of workload that we would to people who would normally do this. So we would go to work and just – it was all done quite leisurely, mm -hmm. slowly, lots of – stopping and telling stories. He, he had lots of stories to tell us about Queen and and um, sometimes even the scores needed tweaking and sometimes there'd be chords. And I'd go, blessed with this phenomenal ear, and being guitar player, I'd go, sorry to say, Mike, but that chord's wrong. And he'd, he'd go, play it, and he'd go, oh, everybody, James is right, get your pencils out, and we'll be annotating script the, the scores as we go. And um, so we had the luxury of, like, so the first week was learning everything and then starting to put it together. And during the second week, that's when Brian and Roger flew out. Right. And then we had, like, a week of um, previews before opening night. Um, a very drawn-out process, which I've never experienced since. And yeah. I know I know it was a one-off. But we had <laughs> myself and the other guitarists had never played theatre before. Yeah. The drummer had never played theatre before. The bass player was an absolutely super skilled theatre player. Mm -hmm. So you had, and then we had a percussionist who was a skilled theatre player. And the three keyboard players had all done theatre. So re really, basically, it was just the two guitarists and the drummer. Yeah. But, but it, it makes sense, though. Like, why put all that time and effort into finding the right people to then not set it up correctly to give yeah. them to, to put it all together? Oh, it, it makes sense. I was super blessed because I'd come from a completely different world. Even though I'd played music, I'd never played it in that environment where an M. So I'll give you an example. We got to the end of one of the songs in rehearsals and it had like a live ending, you know, like sim pl play the chord, symbol, yeah, yeah. and the drummer gives. So me and the other guitarist turn to look at the drummer and wait for the drummer so we know where the button is at the end. And we get to the end of the song and then the MD just starts laughing his head off. I said, what are you laughing at? He goes, I can tell you guys have never done theatre before. And I said, why? He goes, because you look to the drummer for the end of the song. Yeah. He said, in musical theatre, you look to me. I give you the ending. And I went, oh, okay. You know, like, and little did I know that he cues everybody off, right? That's how naive yeah. I was. I just, because I'm playing these rock songs in a, trying to keep it in like a rock environment, but in, <laughs> in the umbrella of a theatre show. Yeah. He's basically the conductor of, of an orchestra, almost. yeah. yeah. So even yeah. in that environment, the MD still is king, right? So even if it's a live end, it's the MD that gives the ending. Yeah, we all take our cue from him. But in my naivety and in like 15 years of playing on pub stages with fellow band members, in live endings, you look to the drummer to see where the ending is. So what? That, that illustrated how naive I was. What about – so So you turn up for rehearsal. Now, they obviously liked your style of guitar playing. Maybe they liked – your attitude, just the light you as a person. What about when it came to, I mean, you show up with with your own guitar, but they obviously want a certain sound. So what happens with regard to guitar, amp, effects, yeah. pen, like, like who, how, how does that come about? So, again, different shows will do different, do, do things differently. But on the Queen show on the Queen musical because they're trying to emulate or replicate Queen's sound. Mm -hmm. The guitar rig became part of the sound design of the show. So what that meant was that the production provided everything 
and we were hired simply as players to play it. So they bought Red Special Copy Guitars mm -hmm. and they ran it through a very basic pedal board, but enough that replicated what Brian has in front of him. And then they it went into Vox AC30 amps, just like Brian uses, right? So, so they did not want you to bring anything of your own. That's pretty cool. That yeah, you, but that's not, not all shows will be like that, mm -hmm. but some shows will be. And Queen one is definitely like that or has been for a long time. But you're, you're employed to play their equipment because the sound of the guitar is an integral part of a Queen show. And so they wanted to design the rig themselves and yeah. just have you play it, not, not introduce anything into it. I said, not bring any variable like your own guitar or your own pedal or your own amp. Yeah. There'll be other theatre shows you do in your life where you bring everything. And yeah. there'll be other theatre shows in your life where you'll bring some and they'll provide some. So it will depend on the gig, what they're trying to capture or what they're trying to um, put out there. But so when, yeah, the Queen one was just, they provided a lot. When did you get an opportunity then to, to actually speak to, to Brian and Roger? Oh, no. Well, I, I actually got to speak to them at the end of my audition process all those months earlier. Right. I, again, I was so naive. I thought I was doing a really bad job, and that's why I thought they were kept asking me to keep playing the same thing over and over again, but with different people. And I, in my naivety, I'm thinking, I'm doing such a bad job, they're giving me every opportunity to nail this. But really, Brian told me months later, he said, oh, we knew in 20 minutes. We just loved hearing you play so much. We were just trying to find the right people to play with you. Yeah. Right. And I didn't know that. So at the end of that process, Brian and Roger went around to thank everybody for coming. And I just said, you know, obviously you can tell I'm a big fan and, you know, I'll never get this opportunity again. Do you mind if I get a photo? And I remember Brian laughing at me. He was laughing at me because he was probably thinking, I am going to see you again, but I'll play along, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he poses for this photo and there's like little, little nervous, timid me who's idolised this guy since I was, you know, 17 or 18 and had his posters on my wall thinking I'll never get to see him again. But they were lovely. On the day of the rehearsal, they were lovely. Mm -hmm. Then they came to quite a few of our last few days of rehearsals as a band. They would come and listen and let's go, right, Roger would just go over to the drummer and the percussionist and go, yeah, so when I was doing this live, I'd get more up on the ride cymbal here. And I, you know, they were getting that one-on-one -on -one stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, you get, and then what happened with me and the other guitarist? Brian said, I'm just going to, I'm going to arrange for just you, me, you and the other guitarist, me and your MD, just to have a three-hour session. Just, we'll just chat and play. And, um, we went in like 10.30 one morning, just the four of us. Yeah. I got paid to have a guitar lesson with Brian May, basically. So Brian said, you know, like, because you guys are such big fans of us and you're already playing like 85, 90% yeah. of what we want, he said, I'm going to show you those little 10 percenters that will make it super authentic. I'm going to show you how I voiced certain chords or played certain runs or where those runs were placed on the fretboard. Yeah. Where you where it'll sound a bit more authentic to the really big Queen fan. And, and so we had, I had a whole three hour session where he would just take our guitars from us and just, he'll go, this is how I did it. And then hand it back to us and then go, yeah. and we just play it back. And I'm just like, you could have, I remember, I don't know who I must've run. I rang somebody after that going, you'll never believe what I just did. <laughs> yeah. like, I yeah. was still looking at it like this kid in a big lolly store and riddled with, Riddled with um, imposter syndrome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally riddled with it. Well, but what Brian was so good because he was like, no, I, I, I don't care what your background is. I've picked you because you can do this. Yeah, I really want you to do this, you know. So um, my biggest ally was Brian May, for sure. How was it, see the very first show? So see when it's five minutes before it starts your, your setup, so do you've all, I'm assuming you've done rehearsals in the actual theatre. Yeah. You're all set up, but, you know, it's an empty theatre. So how are you feeling five minutes before the, f the very first ever show that you have played as a guitarist? I think I was, I think I was pretty nervous. I, yeah, I'm just trying to recall exactly how I might have felt. Perhaps it was a bit of a blur, and that's why I'm 
<laughs> was I remember, like, like, if you're doing a gig, the, the, yeah. you might have the nerves. The minute you start playing, right, it's fine. Get the first song done out of the way. Yeah. And you're fine after that. But it must have been some feeling just the five minutes before the very first ever. Well, it was hard because we had Brian, Roger and Ben Elton they stayed with us right up until our official opening night. Had All right, okay. And then they left. But we had like five or six previews, what they call previews prior to that. Previews are done to a live audience who right. buy tickets, but generally at a reduced rate and generally with the disclaimer that something could go wrong in this performance. So, Is that the ones that they use for, for doing reviews? Um, no, normally the reviews are done on opening night or something okay. like that. But um, a preview is, is a way of of conducting the show under show conditions to an audience, but also allow for stoppages or errors that may happen because you haven't had that opportunity to run it and time everything. Um, and so as a result, the audience will get their tickets cheaper. It's not actually called an opening night. Mm -hmm. um, and the disclaimer is this show might have a stop tonight because we're in preview mode. Right? It's just an opportunity to iron out any last minute yeah. Issues yeah. that, that you might not so, be aware of. Yeah, so we, I think we might have had like five or six previews in a row. Right. And then opened on the Friday night or something like that. I don't remember what night we actually opened now, but there was a, you know, like the seventh show we might have played might have been the technically the first show of the run. Yeah. Like, so, so, and that's the one that the press come to, especially with Brian Rudd and Roger in the house, all the press came to that. So, so this is all probably within within a well. This is in within six months of. Yep, my life you, completely changed. So that must have been a strange feeling to be working a, a normal job, to then being hold on. I, I'm going to be getting paid to to play my favourite songs. Yep. Do you know when I was playing covers in my twenties and playing in pubs? Part of me always wondered if I was good enough to, mm -hmm. to play at like uh, the what I, whatever the next level was. You know, yeah, I yeah. don't know what the next level was, but there's there's different all kinds of levels to being a musician. You can go down the musical theatre path. You could be playing. You could make a living playing covers or playing in a tribute show. You might be successful with your own songwriting. You might join as a backing band for Dua Lipa or something. I mean, there's all different things. I didn't know what my next level could be. Yeah, but I often wondered. Would part of me thought I think I'm probably good enough that I could, I could get to another level above this. Yeah. But I didn't know what that was, and I didn't know how that would ever come about. It was pretty fluky. I never planned to be a musical theatre guitarist ever, but I was a massive Queen fan, and Queen put this product out that fell into that, and I had a crack at that. I mean, if, if it had been the Led Zeppelin musical or if it had been the Nicki Minaj musical, there's no, no way I would have had the same level of success or opportunity. You must be forever grateful to those friends that took that CD. Yep. Yeah. So when I – it's a great story to share and have a few beers with, with some people who really want to hear it, but that, the whole story about how, what they did and how they did it and where they did it, it's, it's phenomenal, and I really need to write it down one day, so it's never <laughs> lost. So when did you cross paths with Alex? So Alex was – so I was fortunate enough to do the first ever Australian tour of Wheel Rocky. It went for two years and one month. That's how long it was. Wow. Yeah. It sat in, like, sat in Melbourne for nine months straight, and then it went to, went to Perth for three months, Brisbane for three months, Sydney for eight months, and then Tokyo for three months. Okay. Right, and then it finished, and I thought, well, you can uh, you can shoot me now. I can die a happy man. It's okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter what happens now. Uh, everything yeah. complete. I even went back to civil service work. You know, I went I, I went back to working in an office. I put I, I think I put my name down at a temping agency or something. But what happened was because I'd done that one, every time they wanted to do another one of those, I, I'd get asked. And as a result of working with people in the Australian industry, those guys are theatre guys, and I'll go off and do other theatre shows. And then, then I started getting calls like, do you want to work on Mamma Mia? Do you want to work on School of Rock? And I'd be like, I can't do them. Of course you can do them. You did Rock You. It's the same thing. Yeah. Like, yeah, but I'm just a Queen fan playing guitar. And I, 
They go, no, no, you're a, you're a guitarist that can play at this level. You know, you need to do, you need to believe. Like I had, I've got some good friends. Well, you need to believe that you can do this. And I'm like, I can't do that. But I did. I had a go at those things. I got to do other shows down under. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, f I eventually got a phone, believe it or not, I got a phone call on my phone from Brian May. I was actually leaving work at five o'clock on a Friday to yep. go and set up with my covers band at the local pub to play. And my phone rings and it's Brian May. And he goes, what are you doing? I said, oh, I've just finished work. I'm about to go set up with the covers band and go and play. And he goes, well, I've got, I've got something I want to ask you. He goes, I know you're a dual citizen. I know you've got a passport to both countries and we're going to put We Will Rock You out on tour across the UK. The first ever time. We've been reluctant to do it because we never wanted it to detract from the, the run in London. Right. He said, but we've actually done the numbers and we think that we can do both. We're going to keep the one in London running and you guys are going to go all around the UK. The job's yours if you want it. And I went, really? He goes, yeah. So I went, okay. So there's... So in 2000 and I guess that's nine, 2009, right. I flew from Australia out here to do the first ever We Will Rock You UK tour. And Alex was our leading man. Right. Okay. That's how I met Alex. Alex was cast as Galileo mm -hmm. and um, we hit it off straight away. Like, I don't know what it is about Alex. Well, you know, I mean, you know him better probably than I do. He's mm -hmm. part of your family, but I don't know what it is, but we clicked immediately and have remained really good friends ever since. We were just trading messages yesterday. So we've remained very good friends ever since. And in this country, I don't have too many friends, and he's certainly one of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, since I've made the decision to sort of settle here more permanently about four years ago. Yeah. I still don't really have the kind of friend network that you would have norm that normal adults would have. You know, they're all mine are still down under, you know? Um, but Alex, Oh, we, we hit it off so quickly and we knew we were different to the other guy. So on our day off, we'd go and watch movies together where everybody else would be like recovering from the huge piss up they had the night before and sleeping off their hangovers and, and what have you. But we would be doing <laughs> nerdy things like, talking music and hanging out together and watching films. and Maybe, maybe it's the fact that he's originally from uh, some, somewhere else. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, he's a French-Canadian trying to make a go of it here in, in an industry that he loves. Mm -hmm. I was the same. I'd, I'd left everything that was near and dear to me behind. My children were still children at that point. Yeah. Super, super tough decision to make. I remember getting on the plane. I was estranged like separated near divorce from my wife at that point. But she was still quite supportive of, of me and the opportunity. And she said, you know, you need to, you need to make the most of this opportunity. You need to go. Mm -hmm. But I remember my daughter crying in my arms at the airport. And of course that set me off. And I must've sobbed for the first three hours of that flight. I think the air hostesses, they were very worried about me. And I remember, I remember saying to my ex-wife before I got on the plane, I said, I think I've made a massive mistake. You know, like, how can you leave two young kids behind to chase what's important to you or what, or what dream that you might have? <laughs> Brian May said something really nice to me about that because he's a guy who's done exactly the same thing. He had a young family. He was married with young kids and Queen were massive and they go off on these huge world tours. And he said, you know, hindsight tells me that your children will understand then you put way too much pressure on yourself as an adult, but your kids will get it. Your kids will understand that you need to do this. This is part of you. You're not only that, you're a role model to them. They're looking at you going, wow, look at what dad's able to do and what dad's about to do. And that gives them something to aspire to. But not only that, they understand it at like a some sort yeah. of deeper level that dad needs to do this. You know, That's and that, that, that other thing as well, though, is that despite maybe not obviously things ending the way you wanted but with the mum, you, you know they're being left in a good situation. Yep, yep. You know, she, she's, you know, they've been left with their mum, their mum's capable of looking after them, good person, so they're, yep. they're safe hands. And, and, was, the, and was supportive of my opportunity, yeah. Yeah, but the other thing as well, though, and, and you'll know this, they don't stay young for very long. No. But it'll be that thing now that when they're, now that they're older, and that they're capable of understanding the whole situation, they would probably turn around and say, 
if I was in your situation, I would have done the same yeah. in decision that you made. Yep. You know, yep. so it's pretty cool. I I actually saw We Will Rock You in, a, in the West End, but I think I seen it in about 2004, 2005. So like, it, it must have been quite new to the yep. West End. Uh, when I seen it, I don't even think Alex was was maybe part of it. No, I think Alex only became part of the West End after we'd done our first tour together. I think so. He was our first ever leading man on tour, and I think he left early. He left with about two or three months to go because he had a pre contractual arrangement off to do um, Legally Blonde. Right. Okay. But right. Just which which we, where he met Jane. Right. So he was our. Alec, he was our leading man right up to and including about with about three months to go and then he stepped aside and then somebody else did the end of run of that. Yeah. And then it was after that that he got a chance to do it in town. Yeah. So then they suddenly had two products, right? So they were like, oh, one can feed the other. And it used to. They, they would say, oh, so-and-so's gone down sick in town. Well, we'll just take this person off tour, mm-hmm. pull them in and bump yeah. that understudy up. Well, that happened more than once. Yeah. Yeah. So being a being a big a big Queen fan, have you, have you had the opportunity to see the current Queen? It's the only line I've ever seen. So they 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 came down under a couple of times. Obviously, once in about seventy three when they were not even known to anybody. Right. Um, I think they came down under in about seventy nine, but I was only about eight or nine. They came down under in nineteen eighty five. I think it was on the. Um, the works tour and I was only 14 and <laughs> I didn't get the opportunity to go and see them. That would have been the last opportunity to see Freddie. That would have been cool. Yeah. So, but they definitely did come down under more than once with Adam Lambert. So I've been very fortunate to see them, but not only that. What were they, I, they, Paul, was, did they, they done it with Paul Rogers as well? They did. I, I never saw them with Paul. Somebody, a bigger Queen fan than me will probably correct me, but I'm pretty sure the Paul Rogers lineup never came down under. Right. Right, and I was living down under. So, but the Adam Lambert one just certainly did. And um, by then I had this long working association and relationship with Brian, so he would fling me tickets when they yeah. come to Brisbane. So I got to break, I got to finally take my children to actually meet, meet yeah. Brian. Brian... Uh, Brian said something to my kids like, you know, thank you so much, guys, for letting me borrow your dad off you for all those years. Or, some, or words to that effect. Yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought it was really sweet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely seen Queen about three or four times now with Adam Lambert mm-hmm. um, doing his thing up front. Yeah. That's the only lineup of Queen I've been able to see. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, um, I mean, obviously, what show are you in at the moment? So, I've been really fortunate to um, score the guitarist role in Blood Brothers. Right, okay. A tour of Blood Brothers. When did you start that? So I joined at the start of this year. I replaced a phenomenally good guitarist called Ben Fletcher, who had done it for 11 years straight. Wow. The Blood Brothers, if anyone knows musical theatre in this country, it's run and run and run. It never stops running. Mm -hmm. Um, It takes little breaks here and there, but it just keeps going. So yep. it did like a it did like a fifteen year run on the West End. By the time it closed on the West End, it was the third longest running West End show of all time at the time of closing. And then it went out on the road, and it's never stopped touring. So some of those people who associated with the show have been associated with it for multiple years. We're talking yeah. twenty years or so. So um, yeah, I got to replace Ben. Basically, Ben has a young family, just wanted to change his. Um, Peace. Ch- change up his lifestyle a bit, you know. Wanted to be more ha- more around the young kids rather because mm-hmm. these kids are young, young, not like adults like mine. Or, mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, he probably made it, you know, probably is a hard decision to say goodbye to something like that. But um, I got an opportunity to dep for him mm-hmm. and um, that went well and it led to a few more opportunities to dep and then they were like, well, Ben would like to leave and we would like you to stay. So I actually joined for the for – the, they do two tours a year, spring and an autumn tour. They break for summer and they break for winter. And um, so I joined for the first part of this year. So that was my first my first experience on the road with Blood Brothers. 
And obviously, once you get into the theatre world, you, you then get exposed to all the other shows. Is there is there another show that that you would like an opportunity? Is there one that stands out that you go? I'd, I'd love to. Um, the thing is, the older I get, the more I realise that I can't be all things to all people, and that's okay. I mean, there are good guitarists out there that can do pretty much a bit of everything. Yeah. And I, and, and my hat goes, you know, but they're, they're not, I don't, I wouldn't consider them to be the norm. I think you select your band on the basis of who's a strong player in that genre that you're looking to, to do. Yeah. That's what I think. And without trying to, without selling myself too short, my wheelhouse is like pop rock stuff. Right, I don't think you're ever going to employ me to play My Fair Lady or anything yeah. like that. But, but the gigs I have been fortunate enough to do, We Will Rock You, Mamma Mia, another strong pop show, um, Jersey Boys, another strong pop show, School of Rock, another strong rock pop show, right? They, these are things that fall work nicely within my ability and what I like to play and what have you. So when I look at shows that I might like to do, they're the sorts of shows... I mean, I love doing Mamma Mia. I mean, I, I, I loved it, and it really did stretch me. Um, Jersey Boys was also great fun, playing those classic tunes from those guys from that era. Yep. Um, and I would not say no to going back to shows like that. I would love to do shows like that again. And then I look at something that's coming back out again, say like Bat Out of Hell. I'm just like, okay. I saw the last production of it. And I saw that phenomenal, almost 10-piece band or whatever it was. I was fortunate enough to be invited into the pit and sit there and watch those guys up close and personal do their thing. And I was like, oh, wow. Getting to play those tunes in a live environment, um, it, just, it just sounded amazing. I'd love to do something like that. But I don't have any super specific – I'm just open to anything that might come along that I feel like I could pull off. Now, now that you've you've been in the theatre world for for quite some time, can you go to a show as someone just going to watch? Can you go and just watch it, or do you automatically focus on on the the musicians? Or like, I would imagine I've never asked them, but I would imagine with Jane and Alex, they'll go to all these different shows, but there must be part of them that that they're sitting watching it. But there must be part of them that Jane will be looking at the dancers. Of course, they've they've done that wrong, or Alex will be thinking about maybe someone's vocal line, or uh, it's just natural because yeah. you're a world that you you will focus on what you know. Are you the same when you go to to see a show? I've always been, I've always been the world's worst sort of punter. I <laughs> even as a youngster, like early twenties, I'd go to see bands play in other pubs and stuff. Yeah. Like that. I'd, be, oh, I'd, I'd do one of two things. I'd think either I wish that was me up there because I could do better than that. Yep. Right? Or the other part would be would be I'm so enamored by this performance. Like, I just can't stop. And I, I, know I want more and more and more of it. You know, like I, I find it very hard to just switch off and just allow them to just entertain me and me just be like passive in that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm always listening. So – even when I am at my most passive, there's still this very active listening thing going on. Like, um, I can't help it. I just can't help it. Yeah. Um, sometimes too. Yeah. I, I mean, I get, I get really moved or emotional just by superb musicianship, irrespective of the instrument or the player that's playing it. So it's, I'm not, sometimes I'm not necessarily just tuning into the guitar lines. Sometimes it's like, I'll be like, Sammy, listen to that bass play. Like, it'll be, well, listen to the drummer. The drummer is unreal. You know, like, I'll just, there'll be something about it musically that I'll be latching on to. It's a wee bit the same when, a lot of the time when you hear actors uh, getting interviewed and they, they can't go and just watch, uh, if they've got to go and watch a film that they've they've just filmed, they can't just sit as a, co- as a cinema goer and just watch the film because yeah. they're, so focused on their own performance, I should have done that different yeah. or this, that, the next thing, or something comes up, a memory about when they filmed that particular scene and it was difficult, or they find it hard to just sit and and just take it in as just somebody watching the movie. Yeah. So 
kind of the same. But James, what have you got planned for the rest of the year? We're halfway through 2024, so what's the plans? So Blood Brothers is on its summer break right now. Yep. Starts up again in August, so I've got about another four weeks um, to go, and then I'm back on the road for the second half of the year. Takes yep. us right through till I think the second or third week of December. I think it's the second week of December. I think we finish in Leeds. So we will be on the road from August, starting in Cardiff. Um, we're coming up to Scotland for four cities. We're doing Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen and Inverness, all one after the other. Um, so we're going to spend a month in Scotland, which I can't wait for because I love it up there. <laughs> not just saying that because you're on the other end of this screen. No, I do. I love, I love Scotland. It's unreal. Um, yeah, so it's Blood Brothers from when we get back together on the first or second week of August. It's just Blood Brothers on the road until December. Yeah. Yeah, and then it will break again for um, about four to six weeks roughly, and then we'll go out again in 2025 and start again. And I think the first city is Wolverhampton. So we know a little bit about what's happening next year. So, um, But that's it. That's I've been so fortunate to join this particular show for a few reasons. One is... Musically, it's got a bit of everything going on. It's a phenomenal play for a guitarist. There's everything from touching ballads through to out and out noise, right? And as a guitarist, you know, out and out noise is always a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so it's it's challenging without being daunting, if that makes sense. Like if one starts getting into that area where you, you, you're so daunted, that's not fun. So I like to find that line just underneath where you, you can be challenged but still find it enjoyable. Yeah. Especially if you have a really good night and it all comes together, it's like, whew, yeah. Um, so I love, I love it. From it's just fun to play, and it's a really great guitar chair. But the other lucky thing about this show is it hasn't stopped touring for years and years yeah. and years. And every other show has, you know, they're eighteen months on the road or nine months on the road, and then it ends. And then you look for the next gig, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're for, if you're connected and fortunate enough, you do roll on to the next gig. If you're not so connected, hello. That's difficult. So I'm so yeah. fortunate to have joined this long-running show. And I and when I was in Rocky, I felt like I belonged to a family. Mm-hmm. And I've got that same feeling on this one, which suits me. I, I like that feeling of longevity and camaraderie. And um, it has been daunting, actually, to join a long-running show with long-running people in place. Yep. Put a lot of pressure on myself personally, particularly in the first six or eight weeks. Had a real tough time of it just put so much pressure on myself about, you know, I was very aware that I'd replacing a guy who'd done it for 11 years and they, you know, just big shoes to fill. And, yep. um, but once I started to realize I was doing an okay job and people were okay with what I was doing, I, I took a lot of that pressure off myself then and just started to really, really find my groove. So I'm really quite looking forward to going back out soon so I can capitalize on the last few weeks of that <laughs> show where I started to feel like it was all coming together, you know, yeah. I really – they're such hard beasts to do. Theatre shows are hard. You've yeah. got to be watching the MD. You've got to be watching your score. You've got to be operating the suite of pedals at the right time. And there's a small matter of are your fingers in the right place. Yeah. And you learn that choreography as you go. And sometimes it's like it's trial and error. Sometimes you miss a cue because you look the wrong way at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And you need to make that mistake once to know that – not to make it again. But you're in an environment – Thankfully, we've, I've got supportive people and they and human beings are human beings. But, yeah, you need to be – it takes a little while to fit in or to sort out mm-hmm. um, yeah. before it becomes second nature, before you know at this point I'm looking at the MD because he's about to cue me for this so I'll make sure I've got this pedal, my foot's on the pedal ready to go so I don't have to look down to click it. You know, you learn that. Yeah, yeah. You learn all of that. It's like a dance routine. It's not just being here. It's – Mm-hmm. It's all those other factors yeah. too. Um, so, yeah, the first eight weeks, tough, really tough. And then it started to really click for me and I was like, that's my own personal imp- – I'm, I'm my own worst marker and I always suffer from imposter syndrome anyway. So hopefully other people looking in will probably thinking, he's doing all right, job. <laughs> I, I hope so. You know, I often like – I'll just leave you with that image of the duck along the top of the water. The on top looks so serene and just getting it and underneath his little leg. So that's, that's me, man. Yeah. Definitely. Well, James, we've obviously been quite um, serious up to this point with all the technical chit-chat. Uh, so I like to end things with some fun questions. I go for it. So 
Imagine you could go back in time. You could go yeah. anywhere in the world. Small gig, big gig. It's up to you. Uh-huh. What concert you wish that you could have attended? I would have loved to have just. <clears throat> I, oh well, I have to wear my Queen hat. I would love to have seen Queen at the height of their powers in the late seventies. So. Yeah. Or even mid seventies, even even just getting famous, night at the opera, kind of. They were playing, you know, theatres to like three or four thousand people across the UK and playing things yeah. like Bohemian Rhapsody for God's sake. I think that would have been fun. So I would have liked to have seen Queen in their late twenties, so like late seventies when they were just where Freddie was like a powerhouse. Yeah. yeah. I don't know of a specific gig. But somewhere in that time period, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. yeah. Obviously, you, you you play the guitar, but is there another instrument that you wish that you could play? Um, I can dabble on the bass and the piano and the drums. Mm-hmm. I wish I was a far better piano player, but oh. I can already play that. So if, in terms of another instrument, um, I wish I could sing. Right. I, like, at best, at best, I'm a back, backing vocalist in a covers band with a really good vocalist singing up front. And if you need that horrible warbly thing, I can <laughs> probably manage that. Um, but I wish I could sing. Yeah, I wish I had a really great voice. So I could do the whole strum a guitar and sing a song to you thing. I'd love to do yeah. that. Yeah. As you know, there's millions and millions of amazing songs that have been written and recorded across the years. What's the one song that you wish you could have sat in the recording studio to witness it being recorded? Oh, what a question. Um, I've seen a few documentaries on it. So I, it's hard. For, look, I'm even wearing the shirt. I can't get away from it. Let's make, it have to just be Bohemian Rhapsody, wouldn't it? Yeah. I, I just think the process they went through, the wearing out of the tape to where it almost became see-through, the... Um, so I always think like Bohemian Rhapsody is the, the one that automatically comes to mind because it's such a unique song. Yeah. But, but part of me thinks it might not have been that interesting because it would have been done in, in bits to the point that I don't think even half the band knew what the end result was going to be. Whereas I sometimes, for me personally, I, I, I think going away back in time to the 60s or 70s, seeing some of those bands... Because the recording technology was so, um, it was what it is today. So a lot of the bands had to record live in the studio. Yeah. So it would have been, some of these songs that you hear nowadays that are that are viewed as classics, it would have been. It's basically you sitting listening to the band playing it live to to witness that in the studio would have been absolutely amazing. I know for a fact that Brian that um, Queen recorded the bass, drums, and piano bed live as well. All right, okay. So that they would do that live, right? And then okay. they'd start to piece their multi tracks on top of that. So at the very least, you would get Brian. Well, uh, Bri- uh, it was a guitar bass track that was Brian, uh, Roger, and John, and if it was a keyboard bass track, it would be Freddie, Roger, and John. Okay. They would do the bed live, especially during the seventies. It might have changed in the eighties when they went synthy and all that stuff. But okay. so bow rap is just piano, bass, and drums live. It's not like uh, up to like you know up to the point where the that's on you. I, yeah. I, I just assumed they would have recorded the drums and then layered everything on top of no, it. No, they didn't do it like that. But I mean, talking about um, hot rodding, like the equipment available to you at the time, the Beatles were the masters at that. They used to talk yeah. about like. Because their old mixing desks were valve, or like tran- not transistor, yes. but they were valve. So they would do things to the valves on it. They'd overdrive them and get them red hot, and they'd get this weird tape saturation happening and all, all the stuff you can't do digitally. But it's that thing as well, though, that the recording gear back then, in the 70s as well, it was so primitive compared to what you have nowadays that it, it almost forced the bands into being as creative as they possibly could. Yeah. Because the recording gear was so primitive. Nowadays, it's almost like, not not for all bands, but there is bands now that the, the creative part's not there because they, they can almost, like, fake it with oh, the right. recording gear that they've got. It, it, it depends. I mean, you're always going to have good bands and good music, but I sometimes think bands rely too much on the recording gear. Of course they can. They can play an eight-bar passage perfectly and just loop that 36 times if they want, you know. Yeah. They don't have to play 
a three minute section of it live. And in the piano bed for bow rap, there's wrong, there's a wrong note here and there, but yeah. they just left it in because it was done live with the drums and bass and all the other bits have gone on top. So it's actually quite hard. I think that would be the perfect one for me to see because they would have done some of that as a group. Then they would have started going, right, let's do the vocal. I would have still loved to have seen that process in the studio of how they layered the vocals and how they layered those guitar lines. I think, I think that would be fun. Yeah. Who's uh, who's some of your favourite songwriters? Um, it's definitely Lennon and McCartney. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you can't, you know, Brian May and Freddie Mercury wrote most of the big Queen hits. Yeah. So, abso- so um, ABBA, I'm, you know, I'm an unashamed pop fan and I just love most of what they've done. Um, yeah, let's think about this. I mean... Uh, are you familiar with Neil Finn from Crowded House? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Neil Finn is a phenomenal songwriter, and Crowded House is an amazing band. He was also in Split Ends with his brothers yeah. prior to that. But Neil, Neil Finn is, is unreal. Like, um, yeah, he can write a song, that's for sure. And, uh, James, last question for you. Who is your Mount Rushmore of bands or musicians? So who's the, who's the four bands for yourself whether it be songwriting, whether it be performance, whether it just be the overall package, who are the four that you put at the top of the pile for yourself? Uh, so, I mean, two two that have been with me my whole life are Queen and the Beatles. Yep. I mean, they're, they're, I guess they're famous for a reason, aren't they? I don't want to sound cliched. Like, I just sound like every other guy. But they are... But I, I they, have to... They, I'm not a massive Beatles fan, but I do think they're probably the most important well, yeah, that, that was, to have. I, I kind of think had they not existed, music would be very different because yeah. they inspired every single person that came after them. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. Do. So um, I think it's hard for me to get away from Led Zeppelin. Okay. Yeah, really really love they weren't probably as diverse as say that's one thing I love about Queen and all the Beatles is um those same four guys in each lineup can yep. give you such different stuff it still sounds like them because it's the four but yeah, they can go from pop to outright rock and and all kind of shades in between from those same four people yeah I really love that about them um mm-hmm. Zeppelin sounds like Zeppelin pretty much all the yeah. time but but how amazing are some of those 70s records? And how yeah. atmospheric is Houses of the Holy? Like, I, I've played Houses of the Holy more times than I care to mention. It's probably my favourite Zeppelin record by a long yeah. way. Um, I don't even know why, but I, I just like the songs on it and the way it's... And you've got one more? Mm. Oh, gosh. I'm going to go with Prince. Prince. Right, okay. Absolutely. I love that last question because it doesn't matter how many people ask, and it doesn't matter what style of music you're known for. Everybody has four completely different answers. Although Queen and the Beatles are probably two of the most... Can I can I throw in my favourite Australian act of all time? Yeah, of course. Midnight Oil. Yeah. Absolutely Midnight Oil. Streets, by streets and streets away, my favourite Aussie act of all time. Yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal band. Probably should be in my top four. James, thanks for uh, coming on. It's been a good talking to you, catching up again. No worries. Uh, who knows, next time I see you, it'll maybe be Christmas Day. <laughs> hey, you never know. I might actually, I mean, I might actually be up there before that. You never know. I'm going to come back on tour, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you're halfway between two of those cities, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we'll catch up at some point. Yeah. Or, you know, come along um, to the show. Get my mom, drag, drag my mum along. Well, I'll c- c- come down and I'll show you through the pit. There you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Cool, but James, thank you so much for coming on. It's been good chatting to you. You're welcome. And, uh, learning some stuff about yourself and uh, your musical journey up to this point. And uh, I wish you all the success in the future as well. Thank you very much, right? Cheers. Cool. Cheers, pal. <laughs>